Wendy Luger, the University Librarian and Dean of Libraries, and I get to welcome you to this celebration of a stunning exhibit. Uh, that's certainly uh, my interpretation, and it's, I'm sure, yours as well, created by our guest uh, curator, Chris Cardozo, and special collections curator, Tim Johnson. And the exhibit was designed by Darren Terpstra, and dare I say, you gentlemen nailed it. It's just, it's just beautiful. You outdid yourselves, yes, you agree. <laughs> There's something special about an exhibit opening, you know, whether it's, you know, some fancy museum in New York or whether it's some small hometown museum or a, a place such as this that celebrates archives and special collections. And each year, the curators in our archives and special collections department uh, put together a schedule of exhibits and the intent, of course, is to reveal the depth and the breadth of our collections. And they're always thought-provoking. They showcase the treasures of our holdings. And those holdings, I can assure you, are among internationally recognized uh, for their breadth, for their depth, for their distinctiveness. But exhibits are far more than lovely things to do for an hour or two. There's obviously extensive research that goes into them and in creating the images and artifacts that are selected to place in the narrative that you see. And it's that moment where the exhibit comes alive when that narrative takes place, when they all come together. An unusual and a unique educational experience for our students, for faculty, for community members. All of you tonight represent those communities. And it's an important role for the libraries, obviously, to share and to expose the wonderful treasures that we have. And that's, that's our mission. And finally, what I love about exhibits is that they don't tell you what to think. Instead, it begs you to form your own conclusions. And I trust that you will tonight and other times when you come back to this exhibit. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, um, Elmer Anderson, Director of Archives and Special Collections, Chris Kiesling. Actually, I just get to introduce the speaker. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to do so. In case you didn't know, Chris is the world's leading expert on Edward S. Curtis and his work. A gifted photographer in his own right, Chris discovered Curtis quite by accident in 1973 after a post-baccalaureate project went awry and left him in a remote Native American village high in the Sierra Madres in Oaxaca, Mexico, where he spent six months observing and taking pictures. Sepia-toned pictures. You can see one of them in the exhibit. And when you do, you'll understand Chris's immediate connection with Edward Curtis. On his way back to Minnesota, Chris visited a friend who remarked on the similarity between Chris and Curtis's work. Soon after, Chris bought his first Curtis prints using a credit card given to him by his father that was intended to be used for emergencies. <laughs> so began a lifetime of devotion to Edward Curtis. While he has collected the work of other noted photographers, including Henry Bossy, Michael Smith, and Linnaeus Tripe, not to mention amassing an enormous collection of photochromes, Chris has been quoted as saying he has followed his soul's purpose in collecting and studying and promoting Edward Curtis's work. In 2012, Chris began working on a republication project for the North American Indian, usually referred to by Chris and his colleagues as Teenair, in preparation for the celebration of uh, the 150th anniversary of Edward Curtis's birth this year. Chris has engaged libraries, archives, and museums around the country in this celebration, most notably in the Northwest, where Curtis did much of his work. The republication is a masterpiece of attention to detail, right down to the selection of ink and paper, the hand in and hand interleaving of the photographs. The entire 5,000-page original was digitized, and the typeface, along with all the special characters, was refined to make it easier to read. All 2.5 million words, all 2,234 photographs. 
In all, over 40,000 hours of painstaking work has gone into teen air with stunning results, and you can see the result in the exhibit. A fitting testament to a man who gave his life to the pursuit of, it's such a big dream, I can't see it all. I want to say a few words about the exhibit. Chris first approached us, approached us several years ago about putting together an exhibit to mark Curtis's 150th birthday, and curator Tim Johnson and I warmly embraced the idea. We understand that the North American Ind Indian is controversial in some circles, that people feel Curtis exploited the 10,000 Native Americans he photographed. However, we also understand that Curtis was struggling to preserve not only their images, but their music and language and culture at a time when many in the United States wanted to exterminate Native peoples. The project bankrupted Curtis and cost him his family and his health. Louise Erdrich captures perfectly the ineffable quality of the images, particularly those of women, when she writes of their intensity of regard. Curtis mastered the art of making his subject so dimensional, so present, so complete, that it is to me as though they are really there in the print and in the paper, looking back at me. G uh, uh, Louise continues, this is the genius and the gift of the work. Chris Cardozo holds a BFA in photography and film and a JD from the University of Minnesota. He is the author of nine books, all of them relating to Edward Curtis, and curator of over 100 exhibitions in 42 countries on six continents. I'm guessing Antarctica is the not one you haven't been to yet. Aw. Chris is the owner of Christopher Cardozo Fine Arts, a gallery that specializes in Curtis prints and exquisitely produced books. He has done an enormous amount of outreach with the Native American community, repatriating, as he puts it, <coughs> thousands of Curtis prints and arranging for copies of the North American Indian republication to be donated to tribal libraries. He is a very generous donor to the University of Minnesota, especially to the libraries, and is helping us build a notable photography collection, which of course includes many Curtis prints and ephemera. Please join me in welcoming Chris Cardozo. And here, I was all set to tell you everything you should think about all this, but I, I heard either, either Chris or Wendy, I'm not supposed to do that. So I'm gonna have to totally change my talk tonight, do it on the fly. Um, so this is really an interesting period uh, in my evolution with Curtis, but before I go into that, I, first of all, I, we have a lot of people who work with me in the two businesses and who have worked with me recently. I would really appreciate if you'd stand up. Peter. <laughs> so Peter, who I always have to cajole two or three times to get him to stand up and take credit for any of the wonderful things he's done is really a co-curator of this show and, um, and many other things. Without Peter, I don't know that my business would still be here. So, and all the rest of the team, they're just great. And I really want to thank Wendy and Chris and Tim Johnson, who has been great to work with. Tim, where are you? There you are. Tim has been wonderful to work with, and Darren Terpstra, if you'd stand up, Darren. Darren designed the whole exhibit, and he was very kind just before we got in here and said, well, you know, it's such great material, it's really hard to make a mistake. And I said, no, it is. <laughs> so they did, everyone really pulled together and did a great job, and I'm very, very pleased. So. Again, this is a really important demarcation point in my life and my involvement with Curtis. First of all, Curtis was born 150 years ago this year. So, big deal. And I started working on this about four years ago, getting different institutions, libraries, museums, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, involved. <clears throat> and it's just been great to see all that's come out of it. And another big shift that's really been happening over 10 years is what we are doing is becoming much more native-centric. When I first started out, I was, a photography, I was a photographer, a starving artist, and somehow or another, I thought I could also become a collector. And that's my father's credit card for emergencies only 
came in very handy. Unfortunately, he didn't tell me I would have to pay back the charge, but <laughs> we, we got it worked out. And a friend, I, I never quite understood what the emergency was until about three years ago. I was with a friend of mine in New York who, a dear, dear friend, and loves the Curtis work. And we were talking about that, and she said, well, Chris, of course, it was an emergency of the heart. What else could you have done? <laughs> so Curtis, 150th anniversary of his birth, I turned 70. And at this point, I'm disengaging from traveling vintage exhibitions. They're just too big, too expensive. And they're wonderful because we've had them in museums where we've had in Palm Springs, for instance, recently. We had 60,000 people come in and visit, and that was I mean, really a thrill. But it's just not where I want to go. I really want to be doing things that are getting out to the world, and, and not exclusively to Native people, but to a, a more emphasis on that. And we can reach them through prints, through we just created Phil back there who stood up earlier is just, there you are, just created a custom DVD of Curtis Images with uh, Hopi, uh, Hopi flute music. Um, so we're fine. And then we've had a number of clients, at least one of whom is here tonight, who have bought our republication and donated them to either tribal colleges or colleges that have large Native American populations. And I've gotten reports from librarians that they've had tribal elders come in who had never, for instance, at Little Bighorn in Montana, that librarian, Tim Bernardus, has had people come, native elders come in who had never been in the library, but when they heard that this, these Curtis books were there, that had a photograph of their great-grandfather, their great-grandmother, their great-aunt, and had uh, deep cultural information transcribed in the, as Chris pointed out, two and a half million words, um, they're coming in, and people, uh, UC Berkeley, the same thing. It's not an easy campus to get to. And the librarian is telling me how impressed she was that there are so many Native people coming in to look at the, who find out about it and coming in to look at the books. <coughs> so that is where my heart is these days. Um, this is uh, part of the description of the show. This was written in the summer of 1900 and Curtis was on his first serious field trip into native country. He had been photographing native people in and around Seattle, but there had been a great deal of, obviously, well, Seattle was a major boom town, second only to San Francisco in west of the Rockies. So native population had been pushed out of Seattle. It was actually illegal for Native people to go into Seattle by the time Curtis was photographing, although some did happily, including Chief Seattle's daughter. Um, but he wasn't with really intact culture up until that point. So over 1900, he goes off into the field with a man named George Bird Grinnell, who had spent 20 seasons in the field with the Blackfeet and the Pagan. And because Grinnell was so trusted and accepted by Native people in, that, in those groups, Curtis was accepted. And Curtis saw so clearly that the culture was really vanishing. He saw one of the last great enactments of the Sundance ceremony until it was revived in part because of Curtis's imagery, transcriptions of language and music, and discussions about the, the ceremony itself. So he saw that everything was changing rapidly. And I, I won't dwell on this too much, but um, the stunning statistic is that in 1600, there were 20 to 25 million Native people on this continent, probably 800 to 1,000 different Native nations. In 1900, there was a really formal, serious census taken, and it was 250,000. So Curtis's most famous image is called The Vanishing Race. And I don't know that Curtis believed that it literally was going to be a vanishing race, although it was certainly possible given the fact that people were still advocating for the extinction, all, the active extinction of all Native people on this continent as late as 1900, 1910. But he certainly could see and believed that it was a vanishing culture. So that became his life's purpose. And when I think on what he created and why he created it, 
to me, it, again, it's a sacred legacy, that it, it was such a beautiful culture, so many beautiful people who lived so wonderfully. Um, that to me, the old, one overall description is sacred legacy. The three pillars are beauty, heart, and spirit, which are all very healing. So if you push me and said, Chris, give me one word that describes the whole thing, it would be healing. And again, it's on all those different aspects. So here he is. He is, uh, in the, on the left-hand portrait, he's just turning 30. On the one on the right, he's in his early 40s in the field in uh, Vancouver, or near Vancouver in British Columbia. And J.P. Morgan was his great patron, and that's why we've included the um, quote about, I like a man who attempts the impossible. So Curtis's big dream, the dream that caused him to lose his family, lose his health, lose his money, everything that he had spent 30 years to be able to accomplish all went out the window to create these sets of books. And there's nothing else like them that's ever created in America. <clears throat> I was talking about this yesterday, and, and Tim had to bring up that Napoleon in, seven, in 1802 created a set of books that might be comparable to this, but they didn't have, as many, they didn't have any photographs, and so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to count it. So today, these sets in good condition will sell for $3 million. Curtis, it was a 35 to 55 million, in today's dollars, a 35 to 55 million dollar publishing project. It's all handmade paper, handmade photographs, hand bound in leather, hand transcribed uh, language and music, uh, beautiful leather bindings, hand stamped and gilt, top edge gilding, and at one point a few years ago, we were trying to just figure out what was the equivalent today of $3,500, which is what these cost back then. And one of my employees brought in a magazine from the same year that this was first published, the first volume was published, 1907, and there was a 9,000 square foot man mansion in Denver for sale for $3,500. So not many people could afford it, and that was unfortunate for Curtis because the people who he had hoped would subscribe got hit by the great uh, economic panic of 1907, which was as severe as our 1908, excuse me, 2008 recession. So there were many, many people who would have supported it who couldn't afford it then, and also there were many people who thought, Curtis didn't need the money because they, everyone thought that J.P. Morgan was completely supporting it, which he wasn't. He gave basically gave Curtis enough money to hang himself because Curtis was left raising two thirds of that today's dollars, thirty-five to fifty-five million dollars. And also, some people didn't like Morgan. So this is Curtis's signature piece. It's called the Vanishing Race. He spent four years from 1900 when he had this concept of creating these great sets of books that would be the definitive record of native cultures west of the Mississippi. He obviously had this idea, as I discussed, of a vanishing culture, a vanishing race. And he was, for four years, he was looking for an image that would represent that idea. And finally, he was in Canyon de Chey, so those are thousand foot cliffs in the background. <clears throat> and it was sunset, and he was going back and seeing the riders in front of him, and he got it. He said, boy, that's it. So everyone stopped, and he was, because he had a 60-pound camera and tripod, so he could not pull, unfortunately, he could not pull out the iPhone and do a quick snap. And he got it beautifully. I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful visual. Um, so I'm going to go through and show you several, actually about seven different print media in which Curtis worked. So Curtis was very unusual in that he didn't have one process or one medium in which he worked. He didn't just work in silver prints or platinum prints or whatever. And this, this is the first image that Curtis would see when he was in the field. These are called cyanotypes. It's the same basic chemistry as an architect's blueprint. And Curtis could make these in the field and he did not need an enlarger, did not need electricity, so he could immediately, he, he would be out on field trips for 
two, three months at a time, sometimes longer. So he needed to know what his negatives look like, whether he's going to get a decent print out or not. So this was his first, this was like his Kodak. From the cyanotypes, he from the cyanotypes he would make silver prints uh, when he got back to the studio. This was a little more refined, a little more nuanced print, and he could get more idea about whether he would make these into final prints. No one knows, and pe people guessed somewhere between 10 and 50,000 negatives were made by Curtis during this 30-year project. And he started out with a 14 by 17 inch negative, glass plate negative. So, I mean, just the, the lo physical logistics of doing this project were extraordinary. These are two that I particularly love because these are not published in the books that we've republished. These are weird little prints that I found somewhere along the line 15, 20 years ago. And <clears throat> it's also part of why I love this work so much and was so attracted to it because I can look at these and to me there there's something uh, to quote Chris Kiesling ineffable um, about these I look at these and I have no idea what the consciousness was that created these or what the consciousness was of the people doing the dances and wearing them so this is another this is a, a very finished exhibition print Historically, maybe the most important photograph Curtis made it was made in the summer of 1900. Curtis was, and I mentioned he, Curtis had gone into the field in Montana. This was the key image made during that two-week period, and that was the watershed experience in Curtis's career. And that is a gold, gold-toned printing out paper print. This is Curtis's, one of his masterpieces. That's Geronimo, of course. And Geronimo, Curtis photographed the three great tribal leaders who were three of the greatest leaders in the United States in the 19th century, Geronimo, Red Cloud, and Chief Joseph. And he was lucky enough to be able to connect with Geronimo in 1905 when Geronimo was traveling to Washington to uh, participate in Teddy Roosevelt's inauguration. And this is a platinum print. And it is a stunning photograph. Because Curtis was constantly, he, he was insolvent, basically, from the beginning of the project till the end. And, and he, so he, he functionally was bankrupt, uh, although happily no one took him to court and he didn't have to deal with formal bankruptcy. But he was always having to sell prints, create movies, create exhibitions, anything he could to try and raise money. These are what are commonly referred to as border prints, so the two Two tones on the border he actually created in the dark room. So today we would use mats and over mats to create something similar, but he did it in the dark room. And that's uh, Slow Bull, a ver another very important spiritual and political leader among the Dakota. This is a beautiful photo reviewer, the ones that went in the books and the portfolios, of a young woman, and it's titled Katika Girl. And this was something that people hadn't really paid, this image is something people hadn't really paid a lot of attention to. And about eight or 10 years ago, we wanted to find an image that we could use for advertising, I had a gallery then, something that we could use for advertisements and uh, publications, whatever, that hadn't been seen a lot as some of the classics had. And Peter and I looked at all kinds of prints and this was the one we came up with. <clears throat> and I am so glad we did that because to me this also represents another key aspect of Curtis's work. Curtis co-created this body of work. It's, people often talk about the photographer and have a sense of taking photographs. Curtis made beautiful images in deep collaboration and co-creation with Native people. And this illustrates it so beautifully. You can't, that woman is so, and it's what Louise Erdrich was talking about too. This young woman is so present. She's so, in a sense, emotionally vulnerable. She is present. It's an intimate photograph. There's so much connection between that woman and Curtis, or at least his camera. 
Um, so this has become one of our signature pieces. And Peter, I'm going to brag on you one more time. Is it okay if I brag on you one more time? Okay. I get one more brag on Peter. He said, that's it. So we were starting to use, we were starting to use this in some advertisements. And Peter said, you know, I went online and I went to the Library of Congress that have a number of Curtis images that were sent in for copyright purposes that Curtis never did anything beyond that, those first black and white prints. And he said, I found, I found this. Now, it's subtle, but it's differently cropped. So there's more space above her head. I think it's a little wider. <clears throat> and it's also really important because it illustrates what a creative process it was for Curtis being a master printmaker. Taking it from black and white to that delicate sepia, controlling the, the, different, the light in her face, the, the whole thing is a very creative act. And I think this is a beautiful photograph, but the photogravure, see if I can get back there. Yeah, the photogravure is just a whole different experience. And he not only did that, but then he said he found some more. So here she is. These were all ta taken probably within 45 minutes of each other. And you can see he was experimenting with almost a full profile, three-quarter profile, and then the straight on, and then the cropping and the coloring. And it just, I think, beautifully illustrates the process that Curtis had to go through to get a beautiful finished print. And this brings up another really good point. And I'm going to try not to sound defensive. I, I, I can get very defensive with about around Edward Curtis. <clears throat> so most of the criticism, I, I've never heard criticism of the ethnographic text, the two and a half million words, transcriptions of language and music. And in fact, before Morgan would cut the first check, he insisted that Curtis go in front of a blue ribbon committee at the Smithsonian who gave him the, the okay that this work was being well done and up to snuff. But in volume one in the very introduction, Curtis states that the photographs were a completely different deal than the text. He said, I I'm doing these as an artist and I'm going to tell the story in images in a broad and luminous Pic, as a broad and luminous picture. So he did not, he did not want to create documents. He was not trying to t tell us how they were living in 1900. Um, there are certainly photographs of his that um, people are very shabbily dressed. There's, I think there are over 600 images in the 2000 in North American Indian that have evidence of Western clothing or Western artifacts. But his real intent was to tell us who these people were, to show us, to get us to feel who these people really were inside, who these people were before they'd had significant contact with the European culture. And um, I've always looked for ways to express that very briefly. Isabel Allende, a, a magical, surre surreal, magical realist writer, was being interviewed on CBC a few years ago, and I finally I thought I found the great way to explain this. Carol Off, who was interviewing her, said, well, you were journalists for 20 years before you became a magical realist writer. And Allende says, yes. And she said, well, that must have been a difficult transition because with magical, with journalism, you have to give the facts. Independently, third party, objective facts. Anyone could take a look at what you've written and say that's true. And I, I, won't, I just realized that leads us into a whole different discussion, <laughs> which I will not go into tonight. Um, but she said you, you had to have something that was objective, that was true, that was independently verifiable. Whereas with the magical realism, it has nothing, very little to do with reality and the truth as we understand it. And Allende said, yes, that was true. And I, uh, Carol Off thought about it for a moment and said, it's almost like you're trying to tell a deeper truth than the facts would allow you to do. Right? So it's poetry, it's art. And that's what Curtis was trying to accomplish with the photographs. And I think it's unfortunate that he gets criticized very often for it because people look at it and think they should be ethnographically correct when that was never his intent. Okay, that's my speech. You, you all heard it. This is, this is a hand-colored photograph. Um, I've only seen about 20 of these in 45 years. 
and I was lucky enough to get this one. You can see he's used a pencil to outline the image, then projected it onto a screen, which got the photographic image very lightly underneath, and then he hand-colored over it. Another image he created by projecting an image onto canvas or paper, and then getting an outline, and then using a, br a brush to put photosensitive emulsion on that piece of paper, which then would give you this beautiful photograph that is part photograph, part drawing. Curtis also did hand-colored photographs besides the platinum print. These are actually in the books. So those sets of books that Chris talked about and that we've republished contain not only the 2,234 original photographs, all the text, but 34 hand-colored prints. And they would have had to create close to 300 of them. So someone can do the math for me, but 34 times 300 was a lot of hand coloring. And the last process that Curtis did was gold tone. He figured out that the glass plate negatives, which is what he would use in the camera in the field, when he exposed it, you would get a negative. Like, I think most of us remember the days when we actually had negatives. And so he'd have a negative, but if he took that same sensitized glass and brought it into the dark room and took the negative in the enlarger, exposed it onto this next piece of glass, you got a positive. So you got a glass plate positive that was transparent that then could be backed with anything. And Curtis discovered that he found a, a gold solution that he could back it with that gives it this incredible luminosity and three-dimensionality. This got flip-flop somehow or another, but you get the idea. And it, what I love about it, and it's something that struck me un, unconsciously when I first started looking at Curtis's work, is they really have this deep universality. And I think that's part of the reason why are we still looking at these things 110, 20 years after he made them? What, what is so important? What is so moving about them? Part of it is they really talk about all of us. They are deeply human in their character. They're fundamentally about Native people and Native experience, but they really transcend that also. So I'm going to show you a few images from the Pacific Northwest. This is, I think, a very beautiful still life, and Curtis was a superb still life photographer. While he is known for his portraits, he did beautiful still life work and some beautiful landscapes. This was the first Curtis photograph I saw in that uh, 1973 that totally changed my life. It was the cover of a book. And as I've said many times, I can, re I can tell you exactly where the bookstore was located in the little kind of barrio in uh, Albuquerque. I can tell you where the sunlight was coming from. I can tell you which shelf this book was on and the, the, where the sunlight was coming from. It was a, a deeply transformational moment. And briefly, I've always loved this image. My favorite process that Curtis worked in are platinum prints, and they tend to be very, very rare. And I always coveted getting a platinum print of this image, and it took me 42 years to be able to find one in platinum. And then I was talking to, there was going at an auction in New York, and I talked to a colleague of mine, and a man who ran a major endowment, was making a couple hundred million dollars a year, was all of a sudden interested in Curtis. And my friend represented him for auctions. And I called Bob just to chat. And he said, oh, yeah, well, Tim is, is, wants all the platinum prints at this auction. And I went, well, OK, I've got to wait another 42 years, I guess. <laughs> and a couple days later, I called him about something else. And he said, oh, yeah, you know, Tim decided not to buy the Lummi type because there is a defect in it. And I said, really? And I had another print made from the negative, very poor print that was totally faded, and no one but a total Curtis fanatic would have bought it because it was so faded. But I thought, well, it was alumni type. So I went and looked at that print, and it was the same defect in the upper left-hand corner, but it was in the, so obviously because it was in both prints, it was in the negative. It wasn't a defect in the print, therefore I wanted it. And luckily, no one else bid on it. So those, those are my favorite auctions where I'm the only bidder. 
another image from the northwest coast. Another northwest coast image. California. California. And again, as a, as a landscape and a still life, life photographer, this is why I'm so enamored of Curse. I mean, this is just, a, for my opinion, a stunning landscape, but also it has those still life components with those amazing baskets. And then the plateau region, which is between the plains and the northwest. This is a very famous image of his called the Kootenai Duck Hunter. And he, one of his scouts, or he, found this old elk skin canoe that had been abandoned on Flathead Lake in Montana. And you, I don't know how well you can tell here, but it's actually warped. So you can see that the, the front is straight up and the, the back of it is tilting over. But they resurrected it and then used it in a number of photographs. And again, I think this, this and the last one illustrate well that concept that Curtis was trying to create an artistic body of work that told us a deeper truth than the documentary photographs would have. <coughs> this is Nez Perce tribe plateau. This is the woodlands in uh, Alberta. And while Curtis didn't intend these as ethnographic documents, there is, I, I have a friend who's a, a <coughs> excuse me, a friend who is a fifth generation collector of Native American art, ma mainly beadwork, basketry, et cetera. And I've since stopped having him participate in lectures with me because he always steals the show. He can get his pointer out and say, well, this bead was made in Germany in 1857 and on and on and on. <laughs> And, um, but Jack is amazing, and there is, and he's collected a lot of Curtis because there is so much ethnographic information in them. But again, that wasn't Curtis's primary intent. Curtis went with Edward Harriman in 1899, the, one of the great scientific expeditions of the 19th century. He went with Harriman, who was a, a colleague and a peer of J.P. Morgan. And he put together a major, major scientific expedition, 25 scientists and hundreds of other people. And these were prints that Curtis did in the field in Alaska. And this is what we, this is what we call ephemera. And the university has a great collection of Curtis's ephemera, which you will see out in the gallery. And to me, it just, the, the actual photographs are obviously the heart and soul of the work. But when you look at the ephemera, it so enriches and enlarges the impact of the photographs. And it's very rare, actually, to see ephemera in exhibitions. And so in this exhibition, there probably been, there probably been only six or eight exhibitions in this country in, in ever that have that kind of depth of ephemera. So I highly recommend looking at it. This is another silver print. So this is a very simple, direct, raw photograph. He didn't bother to sepia tone it. I don't think it was ever intended to be sold or exhibited. I found it 15 years ago somewhere or another, and I just love it. There's something, again, about that. One, she's a very compelling human being, and that she's Hopi, and the simple garb and the look speaks volumes. And the fact that it's not toned, that it's not pretty, I think just adds to the impact. Here's another one of the Northwest Coast figures, which is, again, that's a Chilkut blanket. And that the mask he's wearing is actually movable. So the strings that you see, the, the person inside can manipulate to move the, the uh, horns. This is one that I really love. Um, I got this from someone whose great-grandfather had collected it early in the 1900s. And it's so unusual for Curtis to see an image that has a lot of the higher tones, that's so not the deep bass. And then this charming photograph of two Hopi women sitting in the window of an adobe house looking out at you. Anyway, I, one of my favorites. This is a photograph of a Hopi chief, a Walpi chief. 
And this was an er again, another early photograph of Curtis. This was from 1900. And this is the first Curtis photograph that physically moved me. It's about 25 years ago, and I go, I have a small vault in my home where I keep a lot of this. And I used to love to go down, I don't seem to have as much time these days, but I used to love to go down and look at the photographs. And I was it's a platinum print, my favorite process, and I took this out one day and was looking at it, and all of a sudden I had these really strong sensations right here, which I've since learned is my heart chakra. And um, I thought, well, that was sort of weird. I didn't really understand it. I went down a month or two later, the same thing happened. And through working with an American Indian medicine woman, I now very clearly understand that this had literally touched my heart. <clears throat> this is a very famous photograph of Curtis's called Bash Gan, an Apache chief. And on the right, a quick, another quick anecdote. Um, and you can start throwing tomatoes if I, am, if I go on too long. Um, that's a plaster cast on the right. And Glenn, who is with us, hopefully is going to help me with this one. Um, but this is something my sister found online on eBay two years ago. And she called me up and said, gee, we, uh, there's this thing on eBay, and I don't know what it is. I've called the seller. He has no idea what it is. And I thought, and Curtis's grandson has the bronze bas-relief that is made from this plaster cast. Yeah. So I'd seen it in Jim's home in the Seattle area. I thought that this could be the real deal. So I asked Julie to reach out to this man a few more times. He was really nice, but he really didn't know anything about it. He and his wife were moving after 25 years. They were pickers, so they used to go to church sales, garage sales, wherever, and pick up all kinds of stuff. And he just didn't know anything about it. So I finally got him. I said, Julie, would you get him on the phone? This is the day before the auction. And it was listed for $54.50. So I really didn't know what, I mean, this could be a piece of junk, this could be whatever. So I got him on the phone and had him shine a flashlight in the lower left-hand corner of the uh, plaster cast is the inscription made by Alfred Lenz after a Curtis photograph called Bashgon. And I knew, that, I mean, this had to be it. I mean, it wasn't 100% certain, but I was pretty certain. So then we had to go through this whole thing about, okay, now I know what this is. I probably, there's, this is probably unique. I'll never see another one. And I have Vash Gan prints in four different mediums. So to have this would be a real highlight of my whole career. So then I had to spend a night agonizing how much am I willing to pay? Because I don't know who else is looking at it. And as a unique object like this that has such a, a connection to the family. I'm also doing something for another, another granddaughter, different part of the family, who also has one of these. So I only knew Curtis's, grand, Ch Curtis's children had received these, and Curtis had one or two. So I just really wanted it. So I'm going, well, okay, can I pay this much? Can I pay that much? And what about the risk factor? And we finally agreed on a price, and Julie did something where she was able to submit the bid 30 seconds or 10 seconds before the end of the auction. And she called me as soon as the auction ended and said, well, we got it. I said, wonderful. How much did we pay? And I, I mean, I had no idea. $54.50. <laughs> so Bash Gone, again, was very important to Curtis. This is another one of the border prints like you'd seen earlier. He, he Curtis... In, tr in trying to make money to support the money-losing publishing project, as I mentioned, did exhibitions, did lectures. He was a multimedia artist. And this was a, an, uh, a performance that he did at Carnegie Hall and other places. He actually sold out Carnegie Hall two times in two or three days, and he used the same image. And this, this, he had hired Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan to write a full score. He had the orchestra in the pit performing. He had two projectors, so he had slides going back and forth, some film footage, and then he was up in a podium speaking. This is another Hopi man. And again, when, go back for just a second. When I hear the criticism that Curtis staged these or he got, he, he somehow or another manipulated people 
into doing something that they really weren't interested in doing. Among many others, I have them look at this portrait and say, can you really tell me that this man was going to do something he didn't really want to do? <laughs> I don't think so. So we'll see a few more Hopi, and then we're just about done. This is a Hopi child waiting for the return of the snake dancers. And the snake dance ceremony was deeply important to the Hopi because it was a, um, a call for rain. And rain was a huge issue, obviously, in Arizona. And he has got a, a bunch of wool behind him, corn stalks, all the wonderful beads, feathers, again, asking for, <coughs> excuse me, asking for rain. This is a Taos image. Very unusual with the light, all the light tones. This is Canyon de Chez. So like the Vanishing Race, which we looked at before, this is photographed in Canyon de Chez. And it was actually after making this photograph that night or the next night that Curtis created the Vanishing Race. Hopi women with squash blossom hair atop a adobe building. They are looking down at the central plaza watching snake dancers. And we're now going to look at some Northern Plains imagery. This is Bear's Belly. You can see the scars on his chest. Those are from wooden pegs that he would have strapped himself to and leaned back against a pole sometimes two or three days. And this was done for strength and visions. Here's one of the other great tribal leaders. This is Red Cloud. This is a platinum print, and you can see the triple mounting. I mean, Curtis was just such an artist, and, and he was a magnificent maker of objects. So it's one thing to be able to see an image, to compose it, to get a, a great image, but then to translate it into a great object is a whole nother skill set. And with some of the greatest ones, I, I talk about matter imbued with spirit because they, they move people so deeply, and they're so beautifully done. This is an unpublished print, so again, for me as a collector, when I find things that aren't in the books, uh, this, may, this may be one of two or three that exist. And a couple years late, actually seven or eight years after I bought the first one, I was out at auction and got this, and it's a long story, but it was sort of like the guy who made $200 million a year who was going to be bidding against me. I never thought I'd get it. He didn't show up that day. I got it. <coughs> And I called my assistant at the time, who knew my collection very well. I said, Angie, you won't believe it. I, no one else bid on this. I got it. I've never seen anything like it. She said, well, Chris, what are you talking about? You've got another one of the same man. So the, pre the previous image. Whoops, sorry. So here he is, full frontal. And we can tell by the negative number it was done the same day. And again, as a collector, what a thrill to get two super rare platinum prints. That each one is one of them may be unique, but I would be shocked if there were more than two or three in existence. And to be able to get both of them was really great. And then the fact I didn't even know I had the other one made it even <laughs> even, even more fun when I figured that out. Another beautiful uh, Northern Plains image. I'll just if you'll. Give me one more quick second. So the friend of mine who is such an expert on Native American objects and beadwork and all that came with me and Eric Jolly, who some of you may know, who ran the Science Museum for 10 years and now runs the Minnesota Foundation, Community Foundation. And Eric is Cherokee and obviously an expert on things Native American. So Eric and Jack came to Seattle with me about five years ago and were kind enough to speak uh, before I got up, and Jack during to point out the different objects. And there was a woman who was a friend of a friend who wanted to come, but there's no, no room. There's a little bit of standing room, so I got her a ticket so she could come in. She was a teacher, and she was really happy to have been able to do it, so I got this lovely long letter. I thought, oh, how nice. This woman wrote me a three-page letter about how wonderful the lecture was. And as I started reading the letter, I realized she went on the first two pages about Jack. <laughs> and how amazing he was that he understood all these objects and the beadwork. And then she kind of said, well, you're OK. And she, ne and she never even mentioned Eric Jolly, who's an international keynote speaker. So again, now you know why I don't bring Jack to my lectures anymore. 
very unusual winter scene you can imagine with the big heavy equipment, glass plate negatives for a long time, getting into the field. And he also didn't photograph women as often as he did men because women were not as engaged with outsiders as the men would be. And it's just such a beautiful image that so captures the heavy work that women would do and how integral they were to the community and the family. And then just a beautiful winter scene. This is another really rare thing that I got. This is a triptych of three Dakota images. The one in the middle is published. The other two I'd never seen before. And these came from the family of one of the people who were on that field trip, the Harriman trip in 1899 with Curtis, and they've been the family continuously ever since. This is called the Travois. It's a family moving from one camp to another as the season changed. And uh, um, Scott Mamaday, Pulitzer Prize winning Native American author, wrote about this specific image. He saw it for the first time. He was moved to tears. He didn't understand why, I mean, he's native. And he, he knew that there was some connection. When he did a little more research, he found out this, this was his tribal group. Yeah. Here's his quote. So again, in doing this work and making our outreach more native-centric, this is the kind of thing that is pretty wonderful. This is horse capture, and he is the great-great-grandfather of Joe Horse Capture, who works at the Minnesota History Center, and his father, George Horse Capture, was one of the first curators at the National Museum of the American Indian, and George in his 40s was an alcoholic. He was deeply shamed by being native. He had no sense of pride whatsoever. And then he heard that there was a photograph of his grandfather in these books, and he tracked down a set at Gonzaga College, which is near where he lived in Spokane, and he went in and looked at the print. Then he read the, sorry. <clears throat> He read the biography of his fa grandfather, who was an extraordinary man, and that started a radical transformation of his life. He then went to University of Indiana Bloomington, found three sacred songs, family songs, that he had never heard before, that no one had heard for 100 years. And as I said, he then became the one of the first curators at the National Museum of the American Indian. So. We're just about the end, so as I was saying earlier on, this is a very transformational time in my association with Curtis. And you know, we've done books, we've done um, lectures. I did an interview in China, and when I finished the, it was with Voice of America, and when I finished it, I said, well, how many people live in this town? I didn't, it was, I don't even remember now, but the Chinese name I didn't recognize, was Canton, I think. And I said, well, how many people live in this town? I mean, I, I had no idea. He said, oh, about 15 million. And I, and I said, well, how many people do you think we'll hear? They said, oh, about 7 million. So we've had so much great outreach, but so little of it has been consciously focused on Native people. So that's what we're trying to do. This is a friend of mine, Art Cedar, who is a... Um, a Cinnaboyne medicine man. And I was, again, doing some things in Seattle the last few years, and I was doing a fundraiser for the Curtis Foundation. And a friend of mine said, I have a, a medicine man who's a friend of mine. I said, well, ask him if he had any relatives that Curtis photographed. And she came back and said, yeah, he, he, he did. It's a man named Bull Bear. And I said, well, that doesn't sound very familiar. Would you would go back and ask him again? She came back and said, no, no, it was Bear Bull. So in 1973, with my emergency credit card, I was able to get two photographs. His grandfather, her great-grandfather, was one of them. So it was so amazing to me after, four, at that point, 43 years of doing this, and me traveling through time and space, and art traveling through time and space, totally unaware of each other, to then be brought back together, to be brought together by this photograph. And there's the portrait of his great-grandfather, who was an important chief. So we are more and more doing contemporary exhibits. For a long time, we only did exhibits with the vintage work, which is scarce and valuable and sometimes irreplaceable. And so not only are we less interested in doing that, but again, this interest in getting the work out as we are doing here 
getting it out to much broader, much more diverse audiences. So this we did at the Minneapolis Public Library about six years ago, and we were told they had more people come to see that exhibit than anyone previously at, at the library. More people of color come in to see it, and more native people come in to see it and come back to see it than they'd ever had. So again, really a thrill. And there was a guest book there, and there were all these fabulous comments uh, pe and people from Russia, people from Australia, people talking about identity, about history, about knowing the past so we don't repeat it. I mean, really great comments. And everybody, it was generally a very nice script. There'd be a full paragraph oftentimes. Everyone signed it and dated it and said where they were from. And then I went through a few of those and was very moved. And I got to one of the very last pages. So again, that's, this, was, this is one of our inspirations. And then just really quickly, this was an exhibit in Seoul, South Korea. Um, Chris mentioned, or, or Wendy, one of the two mentioned, we've sent exhibitions to over 40 countries, over 100 exhibitions. And so again, to me, it is so amazing, literally from Papua New Guinea to South, Durban, South Africa, to Scandinavia, people are almost always, some people are almost always moved to tears when they're in the presence of these photographs. And it's irrespective of age, gender, education, socioeconomic, it's just incredible to me how, how universally appealing these images are. So we're, we've, all, we've recreated Curtis's gold tones. And it was one of these things that we thought was gonna be really easy. <laughs> <laughs> like the republication, the, the, the 10,000 hour project that turned into a 40,000 hour project. So this took us two years to be able to figure out how to do it. I thought, well, if Curtis did this 100 years ago, how hard could it be? Well, the first shot was we put the, gold, the metals on it. It's actually bronze, copper, and aluminum that are ground and mixed to give it a golden color. And we had to go through many, many tests to decide did we want a yellow gold, a neutral gold, a bronzy gold. We finally got all that, and we, we sprayed it on, and it was like a mirror. They've, got, they've gotten so good at grinding metals now, unlike 100 years ago, it's so fine that it basically you looked at the, this image and you saw yourself. So that was another six months of working with people, and we finally found an exotic car painter. He, he literally has people send Porsches from Japan for him to paint. He's an amazing painter, and he worked out all the kinks when we got that. But again, being able... In, in an, if this were a vintage photograph, this would be a forty or fifty thousand dollar photograph. So we are really thrilled to be able to do it at a reasonable price that is accessible to many people. And here's our re, here's our republication. And we spent, and Chip Schilling, who did a lot of this, just unfortunately had to go to another event, a book event. Um, but he spent oh five or 6,000 hours resetting all the type, eliminating double spaces after periods, eliminating what are called visual rivers that are very distracting. The original text is in the appendix and in the index, eight point letterpress printing. And the letterpress can get uh, blurry parts of the letters can break off. And if you're 15 or 16, you don't have any trouble reading it. But those of us who are no longer 15 or 16 had trouble. So Chip enlarged the, the text, reset everything. And then poor Margaret, who is not here tonight, spent about 8,000 hours proofreading two and a half million words nine times. And she can still see. She's, she's, still, a, she's still able to see. Curtis's original books, and we uh, recreated it in our sets, did, had things like maps, and again, um, uh, language and music. And we're now at the end, but usually someone asks me <clears throat> how I got into all this 40 some years ago. This was it. A professor of mine from the University of Minnesota asked me to make a film. 
Took me five months to save enough money to buy a 10-year-old Volkswagen Beetle, an extra camera body, a few hundred feet of 35 millimeter film, which I would hand spool onto little um, uh, spools. <clears throat> and I got down there, 75-hour drive, found the little town where he lived, knocked on the door, and Alan said, oh, Chris, I should have written you. I decided not to make the film. <laughs> the best thing that ever happened to me, by far and away. I was very despondent. Anyway. I, I, I couldn't stay in the house that was promised to me. I found a little ho one, the one hotel in this little town. It was wonderful, but I thought I wanted an adventure. Car accidents, cars impounded. I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. Came back to Allen's town about two weeks later, and I said, "Okay, I'm here. You know, what would what would you recommend?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, there's this little Indian village 60 miles from here, and I drove through it one time, and it looked pretty interesting. Go up there." So I went up, and as I got to this little Indian village, which you're going to see here and here. People were, st the women still dressed in traditional dress. There were, it's a village of 200 people, the very ridge of the Sierra, Sierra Madres, incredibly remote. And I was with people who had never seen, in few cases, people who had never seen a Caucasian before. Many, many people didn't know what the United States was. Many people thought they lived on an island. So it was really remote. So I'm in this little village, and I'm going, wow, <laughs> this is really cool. And all of a sudden, this six-foot-two white guy comes walking up towards me. And I went, well, this wasn't, <laughs> wasn't quite what I was expecting. Turned out he was an English doctor who'd been studying an indigenous disease in this village. He was le And he said, great, I'm leaving in a week <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm leaving in a week. I have a house that some missionaries had built who no longer live here. You can come back in a week and you can move in. So that I did and created all these photographs. And again, I'd never heard of Curtis, never seen a Curtis photograph, and did this body of work. And I also did sound recordings of language and music, did film footage and collected material culture, all the same things that Curtis done. I mean, much, much, much better than I did on a much grander scale. But again, the connection was so profound um, that again, it's part of why I believe I was led there. <clears throat> okay, last, last slide. This is Curtis, and re you remember early on we looked at him in his field gear when he was 30 or 40, and this really dashing, amazing guy. And this is so poignant for me. This was taken a year before his death, and everybody forgot about him. When the First World War hit in 1914, basically people forgot about Edward Curtis. And he somehow or another slogged through it. He sold off every asset he had to finish the project in 1929, 1930, and everybody still forgot about him. And then two or three years before he died, a librarian in Seattle saw their set of Curtis books, tracked him down, and started a great correspondence with him. So he had some sense of recognition. But a woman also had heard about him who was an autograph collector. So she wrote to him asking him for his autograph. And this is what he sent her, again, taken a year before his, his death. So that's it. I kept you 10 minutes longer than I expected, but hopefully we're OK. Sure. Chris, Chris Kiesling, who is a glutton for punishment, asked me if I wanted to entertain any questions, and of course I'd be delighted to. Yes? Thank you for your presentation. It was amazing. Can you give us some insights into how Curtis ingratiated himself and developed his relationships with the Native peoples to be able to have them permit him to take the pictures in the first place? Right, yes. There, did, could people hear the question? How, how did Curtis gain their trust, basically, right? <clears throat> and it was very, very difficult to do. Native people, as I said, we're talking about 20 to 25 million, down to 250,000. You know, physical extermination, cultural genocide. They were not very happy to see more white people. Curtis, first of all, you, you think about any man who get J.P. Morgan to change his mind for only the second time in 25 years, which Curtis did in terms of backing this project. He's got to be a pretty charismatic, pretty forceful personality. I think it was really, he, because he had photographed in the Seattle area, it would be a day trip or a weekend, and he started to get his feet wet, knowing Native people and learning how they wanted to be approached, what was respectful. 
but it was really that trip in 1900 when he was with George Bird Cornell, the father of the Blackfeet, and no, not a very PC description today, but um, he learned from Grinnell also, don't do this. Don't ask them direct questions about their spirituality. Don't do that. Here's how to do it. If you really want to learn, you know a little bit about it and ask them a question so they are motivated to fill in what you didn't understand or what you understood incorrectly because <clears throat> that's another really important point. I've talked about the co-creation. The native people wanted this record preserved as much as Curtis did. They knew that their culture was being decimated and wouldn't be there for their children and their grandchildren. So they wanted a record. And there, there's actually a lot of records of native groups in, imploring Curtis to come in and visit them and make that record. There's actually a little co competitiveness among the tribes. So he still had to work very carefully. He still was in some life and death situations. 1904, there's a very tough situation after which he never brought his family in the field with him again. Um, <clears throat> so it, it wasn't a piece of cake, but he had a pretty good sense of how to do it. Yeah. Um, you showed numerous pictures. Yes. And in 1909, I believe it was, the Hopi band called Geography. Was Curtis, do I think, played a role, or was it a reaction to him? Oh, quite, no, quite the opposite. Curtis was the first non-native inducted into the Hopi snake priesthood. He, and he spent immense amounts of time with the Hopi, I know until 1906, but I believe he went back in 21 and photographed again. He had a very special position with them. No, they were thrilled that he was doing that work and that the culture was being preserved. I think they were just sick of a lot of tourists coming in and photographing. And Curtis, there was a man... Uh, a, a, a ethnologist from the Smithsonian who had spent 15 seasons in the field with the Hopi and had never been allowed to photograph the snake priesthood or, or, or participate or really get deep knowledge of it. And as a first season there, Curtis was allowed to do all of those things. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I, I don't know the exact dates, but I know Mooney was active, and I think actually starting a little bit earlier than Curtis, as I recall. Yes? Um, Chris, I always heard that Tracy Hart avoided photographs. Yeah. And that there are no legitimate photos of Tracy Hart. That's, that, oh, how I wish. <laughs> <laughs> By anyone. Uh, no, it's my understanding, too, that he would not allow himself to be photographed. Yes. Can, yes, Canyon is pronounced de Shea. It's uh, after the Spanish D E capital C H E L L Y, but pronounced de Shea. No, it's it's actually the oldest continuously settled area in the United States. It's been it's a very um, deeply important spiritual place for the Navajo, and they have inhabited it since the late 1400s. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's in uh, northeastern Arizona. Near, near Monument Valley, right? Yeah, Monument Valley is in Utah, right? Well, I, yeah. Let me re-answer that. Yes, it's near Monument Valley. <laughs> yes. The good question. The wax cylinder recordings. There are. Well, I, I keep hearing varying accounts. I, we used to think it was, that he had made 10,000, and 1,000 of them still existed at University of An Indiana or close to it. It now sounds like there are only a few hundred at University of Indiana. They are um, actually the ones that they're not forbidden for publishing. They are publishing, they're digitizing, and they're uh, making them available online. Yeah. Yes. No, and it's part of the, the sad, did, did Curtis do any work in Minnesota? Or, oh, I'm sorry, did you say the Dakotas? Minnesota or the Midwest. But, yes, so nothing in Minnesota, and I should have mentioned, since we're in Minnesota, Curtis grew up here. He grew up in a little town down near Lesur, Minnesota, called Cord Cordova, 
and uh, left here when he was 17 or 18. But the diaspora after the uh, Dakota uprising, as we call it, or Dakota conflict would be a better description. So many of the Native people le left this area particularly, but left the whole state. So the, the culture was not intact enough for Curtis to photograph, but he photographed extensively in the Dakotas. Yeah. Yeah. Roland Reed. Roland yes, Reed. sure. Yeah, I've looked at his work. And where did he photograph? He photographed mainly along the route of the Great Northern Railroad. He he was he was commissioned by James J. Hill. Mm -hmm. And so he was photographing that whole route in part to gain interest in people going there, moving there, which they wanted to do to get settlements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's amazing the way these things turn up. Um, I, I got a collection of you, and Wendy, I, okay, they're, they're um, <clears throat> I got a collection two or three years ago that he, with the red hair and ponytail, whose name will not be mentioned, uh, and Joey and Phil and other members of my staff have been working on it. It was a collection of 26 really rare process, a gold tone printing out paper print. I've only seen 45 of those prints in, in 45 years. We got a collection of 26 of them from one woman whose great grandfather was gifted all those prints by Curtis because he was Curtis's guide in the summer of 1900 when he was photographing the Hopi. Now there are 10 or 15 images in there I had never seen before. So things like that still turn up less and less. I mean 20, 30 years ago it happened pretty regularly. Someone found something in an antique store or garage sale or whatever, but people are on to it now. One more or are we done? Yes. <coughs> Well, I'll give you a short answer and one I don't often divulge, but since I've got a hometown crowd, I hope I won't get any tomatoes or eggs thrown at me. So I've worked with, an, I mentioned before, I've worked with a medicine woman for 15 years. And she connects me to spirit guides. And I, do, I cannot tell you if it's true that I'm hearing from the cyanotype that was red plume, if I'm actually communicating with him or not through Anne, but I, I believe I am. And a couple of years ago, Edward Curtis was there, as he's done many times, communicating with me and uh, helping me and guiding me. It's actually given me more clarity about my life than anything, those conversations. <clears throat> and we were finishing a conversation, Anne said, he's, he's got other things to do more important than you. He's ready to go. Any more questions? And I said, yeah, why me? I'd, ne I'd never thought about it in the 10 years of talking, why, why me? And he said, because I'm part of his karmic or soul family, he made many, many, many agreements with Native people. If they were going to participate and co-create, he made commitments about getting the work out into the world, getting the work back to their families and their tribal groups. And as I said, he was, he was functionally bankrupt. And when he finished the project, it, the depression was full on. It was 1930. And none of Curtis's children were able to do anything because there wasn't money. And so there was this, these significant unmet commitments that he had made that he wanted taken care of, as did the natives who've talked to me, native people who've talked to me. So uh, apparently I'm, again, part of that karmic family. And for whatever reason, because I had a credit card, I guess, and, you know, <laughs> I, I was chosen to do it. But it, it is certainly, that belief of mine has certainly changed my life dramatically because it, um, there certainly have been challenges in doing this for 45 years. You're one of the links. Yes, exactly. So I think, I, I think that's it. <laughs>